Every ancient ruin has a story to tell. Now, most guidebooks give this structure behind me a couple of sentences, something like Arch of Titus, completed in 81 AD by Emperor Domitian. Not much reason to stick around and look at it for more than 20 seconds or so, then it's onto the Colosseum. But the Arch of Titus has a tremendous story to tell, the consequences of which are felt deeply even today. The arch is named after Roman Emperor Titus, who ruled from 79 to 81 AD. But the fact is, Titus never actually saw it completed in all its glory. It was finished after his death in order to appease the Roman citizens who pretty much hated his successor, Domitian. Now, Domitian not only completed and dedicated the arch, but he was also Titus's brother. Titus was the son of Roman Emperor Vespasian, a power-hungry but savvy political military leader and politician who stepped into the power void after Roman Emperor Nero committed suicide in 68 AD. Now, Vespasian's original military assignment was to put down a Jewish rebellion in the Roman province of Judea. Vespasian's Middle East peace plan basically consisted of crushing the Jewish rebellion under the iron fist of the Roman military. In fact, Vespasian was so successful at this assignment that they named him emperor at the end of 69 AD, before the job was even completed in Judea. When Vespasian departed for Rome, he appointed his favorite military general to finish the job, his son Titus, and finished the job as exactly what he did in an unusually brutal and bloody way. Titus systematically conquered all the remaining Jewish cities in Judea, slaughtering and enslaving hundreds of thousands of Jews. He then turned his attention to the crown jewel of the Jewish nation, the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had swelled far beyond its normal population. In addition to refugees looking for safety behind the city walls, large numbers of pilgrims had arrived to celebrate the Jewish Passover. Titus set the city of Jerusalem under total siege, preventing any food from going in and any Jews from coming out. And when starvation had done its work against the defenders of the city, Titus set four legions of hardened Roman soldiers against the city. Anyone caught trying to escape would be crucified in full view of the city, often hundreds at a time. The Jews were completely surrounded, trapped in their own city, and forced to prepare for a battle they couldn't possibly win with soldiers debilitated with hunger. The starvation was so severe that a Jewish historian named Josephus, who was on hand during the siege, wrote that some Jews even resorted to cannibalism just to stay alive. The destruction of Jerusalem by Roman general Titus was one of history's most intense and merciless attacks. His legions began by catapulting huge boulders into the city, providing cover for the Roman soldiers to begin bashing the northern wall with huge battering rams. Meanwhile, the Romans had built siege towers that enabled legionaries to attack the defenders from a higher position. After two weeks of fighting, the outer wall collapsed, but the Jewish forces were able to retreat to a second wall. But this time, it only took the battering rams five days to breach it. Then the Romans reached the final pocket of Jewish resistance, the Jewish temple. The Jewish temple was the holiest site in Israel. This was where the Jews worshiped and offered sacrifices to God. According to both Jewish and Christian traditions, the old Jewish temple built by King Solomon was the very dwelling place of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Centuries after that temple was destroyed, a new one was built, and it was here that Jesus worshiped and taught and cast out the money changers. By destroying this temple, Titus would make himself infamous. Titus continued his systematic invasion by ordering the Roman fortress next to the temple torn down in order to make room for a broad ramp into the temple complex. Then, with one final violent push, the Romans stormed the temple and butchered every Jewish defender they found. Then they looted the temple and burned it to the ground. They even pried apart the huge stones of the temple in order to get the gold that had melted and flowed into the cracks. And as you might expect in the fog of war, there are multiple accounts of how the temple was destroyed. Josephus records that in a desire to keep the temple as a Roman trophy, Titus attempted to spare it. It was his soldiers that took the initiative by thrusting fire through a window. But another Roman historian writes that Titus himself ordered the temple's destruction. 
Whatever really happened, the sacred house was completely decimated. And as the massive flames reached into the skies, so too did the terrible wailing of the remaining Jews who knew their lives and religion would never be the same. The body count during Titus's relentless attack on Jerusalem was staggering. The surrounding valleys were soon filled with corpses that one defector estimated at over 115,000. In all, Josephus records that a mind-blowing 1.3 million Jews were slaughtered during the six-month siege in Judea. But not all died by the sword. Josephus also writes the grisly account of desperate Jews fleeing Jerusalem to surrender. When the starving refugees were given food outside the city, some ate so much their stomachs ruptured, leaving them dead. According to Josephus, Syrian and Arabian wanderers cut open the dead bodies, looking for coins and valuables that the Jews swallowed before fleeing the city. The destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion and enslavement of the Jews brought Titus incredible fame and popularity back in Rome, especially when he returned home parading the amazing temple treasures, which included a huge solid gold menorah or lampstand. It also launched a persecution of Jews throughout the Roman world that would last for the next 1,800 plus years. It was only natural that a guy as famous as Titus would follow his powerful father as emperor of Rome. And as emperor, he became even more popular. First, he declared his late father Vespasian to be a god. Then he completed and opened the immense Flavian Amphitheater, which we know today as the Colosseum. He also offered the public a lavish 100-day festival of feasting and indulgence and began work on a memorial arch commemorating his great military triumph over the Jews in Judea. Unfortunately for Titus, his popularity was short-lived because, well, he was short-lived. In 81 AD, after only 26 months in office, Titus died of a short illness and under somewhat suspicious circumstances where his brother Domitian's name was frequently mentioned. Hmm. But in a concerted attempt to clear his name, solidify his power, and establish his popularity as emperor, Domitian worked overtime to ride his big brother's reputation to the top. First, he delivered the eulogy at Titus's funeral. Then he proclaimed Titus a god in Rome's pantheon of deified dead rulers. Then he completed a temple to Vespasian that Titus had started, seen here in the ruins of the Forum, and dedicated it to both his father and his brother. And finally, this brings us back to the arch, he completed the magnificent Arch of Titus in his brother's memory. Domitian's extensive PR campaign must have worked because he went on to rule the Roman world for the next 15 years. And though it was built more for propaganda than for posterity, this arch he left behind us is more valuable than dozens of modern history books. First, these carvings give us an almost photographic record of the kinds of loot the Romans brought back from the Jewish temple in Judea. We can clearly see the sacred menorah, the table of the showbread shown at an angle, and the silver trumpets which called the Jews to Rosh Hashanah. So we know that the descriptions we read in the Old and New Testaments of the splendor of Solomon's and Herod's temples are more than accurate. Some of that splendor found its way into the pockets of citizens all over the Roman Empire. The riches of the ransacked temple treasury in Jerusalem were used to strike Roman coins with the words Judea Capta, meaning Judea Captured. Pictured on one side is the face of Titus's father Vespasian, who was emperor during Jerusalem's fall. Pictured on the other side is the triumphant Vespasian standing under a palm tree behind a weeping Jewish captive. From the minting of tiny silver coins to the construction of the largest freestanding arch in Rome, Domitian impressed upon the world that his father and brother had successfully crushed, enslaved, and dispersed the Jewish nation. What Domitian didn't realize was that he carved in stone the evidence of an event many Christians believe was the direct fulfillment of a prophecy about Jerusalem and the temple made in the Gospels of the New Testament. These images freeze in time, an event that the New Testament tells us that Jesus of Nazareth foretold over 30 years before it took place. And Jesus said to them, 
do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. The destruction of the Jewish temple is one of the most significant events in the entire history of the Jewish nation. It is, for example, the reason that ultra-Orthodox Jews always wear black. It's also the reason that a bare shank bone and not a juicy cut of lamb is served during the Jewish Passover meal. And it's also the reason that at an event as joyous as a Jewish wedding, the strange ritual of crushing a glass underneath the heel of the groom is performed. It's all designed to remember the destruction of the temple.